Hey everyone and welcome to another Simple Science video. In this video we are going to be looking at metals and non-metals. In the periodic table there are over than 100 elements and these can be classified into three groups that we can use to basically easily distinguish between themselves. And they are metals, non-metals and metalloids. But in this video we are only be focusing on metals and non-metals. Alright. And you should know that the differences between metals and non-metals are mainly due to the bonding and interatomic or intermolecular structure. So let's get to our first property, and that is shine. Metals are generally more shiny than non-metals if you just compare silver and carbon. Silver is obviously more shiny than carbon, and that goes to many, many other comparisons between metals and non-metals. The next one is that due to mobile electrons, metals can conduct better than non-metals. Now, that means they can conduct heat better and they can conduct electricity better. Metals have a layered structure in its metallic bonding that allows the layers to slide and the glue of the free and localized electrons to basically hold it together. Whereas Non-metals either have rigid covalent bonds or the lack of immovable layers, such as in metals. So therefore, non-metals are stiff and brittle, obviously. If you were to try to break apart a piece, a piece of coal, it would seem very brittle, alright? Metals have stronger bonding, mostly metallic bonding, than non-metals, which mainly have intermolecular forces between its molecules, and therefore, due to stronger bonds, it has a higher melting point for almost every metal, alright? And also, these bonds are closer, so therefore, there are more metal ions, metal cations, or metal atoms, if you were to consider it, basically in a fixed volume, when you're comparing it to non-metals, so therefore, they're generally more dense, all right? Metals, when they take part in reactions, they form positive ions, and non-metals generally form negative ions, and you were to see this reaction as an example. And the final point is that metal oxides are generally basic, whilst non-metal oxides are generally acidic. For example, magnesium oxide or sodium oxide are basically very basic oxides, whereas non-metal oxides like sulfur dioxide or nitrogen dioxide or any other oxides of nitrogen, they are generally acidic. Here are a list of some exceptions to the properties and its general trends I have just talked about. Graphite, which is non-metal, comes from carbon, can conduct electricity. Graphite has movable layers and are, is greasy. It's basically the same as metals in metallic bonding. Hydrogen, a non-metal, actually forms positive ions, which we would expect it to form negative ions. Mercury, a metal, which is supposed to have a high melting point, has a low boiling point. It exists as a liquid at room temperature. And group 1 metals like sodium or cal cali, basically potassium, have low melting points and densities, which are properties that you don't expect from metals. And here are some, uh, this is basically the key, the key ideas that we've just talked about since the start of the video. Metals are shiny, non-metals aren't. Metals can conduct electricity, non-metals don't, and they can conduct heat, of course, and non-metals basically don't conduct them very well, they're insulators. Metals are malleable, non-metals are brittle. Metals have high melting points, higher melting points than non-metals. And metals are denser than non-metals. Metals form positive ions and non-metals form negative ions in reactions. And the final point is that metal oxides are basic and non-metal oxides are acidic. Thank you for watching my video. Please come back and watch the previous videos to basically not miss anything out. Thank you very much for watching my video and please like, comment, and subscribe. And if there are any questions that you don't understand, feel free to comment. I will help you. Alright, see you next time. Hey there everyone and welcome to the Simple Science video. And in this video, in our IGCSE Chemistry Revision series, we're going to talk about relative atomic mass and relative molecular mass. To kick things off, let's look at the whole picture. Alright. 
atoms are very very small species, and they have a very very small uh, mass. Uh, atoms have very small masses, and therefore they are almost insignificant compared to things in the universe that are significant. So they can only really be compared to nothing else but each other, or pretty much other atomic particles such as protons or neutrons. All right, and this is because the mass is just so so small, even compared to uh, say, well, this is not a really good example, but uh, compared to an electron. Their masses are significantly different in, in orders of magnitude. So the only way in which we can make sense of masses of an atom, and we can use to compare them, is to be uh, to compare them against each other. And there is no better way to compare them against each other through the use of a standard atom. All right, a standard atom must be used in order to basically compare and give numbers give uh, quantifiable measurements that we can use to give each dis uh, each uh, element its distinct uh, understandable mass. All right? So this standard atom is a carbon-12 atom, and it has the standard mass of about 12 units. I mean, exactly 12 units, sorry. Exactly 12 units. So you see how I'm bracketing 0 0.000. That's an infinite number of zeros. So it's exactly 12 units, all right? So other, other elements uh, with atoms uh, for particular isotopes, such as this atom of magnesium-24 isotope, is given the 24 standard mass because it is twice as heavy. This particular you know, isotope of an atom is uh, discovered to be twice as heavy as the carbon-12 atom. So therefore, since the carbon-12 atom has a relative relative mass, I'm sorry, the standard mass of 12, exactly 12 units, our magnesium atom of this particular isotope will have a relative mass of 24, because, you know, 12 times 2 equals 24. Similarly, for hydrogen atom, um, which is experimentally found to be one twelfth as heavy as the current twelve atom, so therefore it has a relative mass of one. All right. So, well, this, however, calling it a relative mass really does not consider the fact that elements in the um, elements in the universe they exist uh, as many different types of isotopes. So therefore, each element must basically have a single number in which we can use in order to quantify it in our calculations in uh, stoichiometry. So we need to basically average out the relative masses of each isotope for each element all right, in order to give us a relative atomic mass, a single number, a single distinct number for each atom that we can use for quantifying and uh, f to help us uh, in stoichiometry, all right? So, for elements that do exist as a single isotope, basically their relative atomic mass is the relative mass of that particular isotope. However, for elements such as chlorine, which do exist as more than one isotope, in this case two isotopes, we must average the relative masses based on the percentage abundance in the universe um, in order to find our average relative atomic mass, our AR, for the element chlorine, its distinct number. And we do this by multiplying, I'm sure you've done this before, multiplying the relative abundance by the relative atomic mass of that particular chlorine isotope. Uh, so basically the sum of that, that gives us 35.5, so that's our average relative atomic mass that we basically... Uh, we put on the periodic table and we use the stoichiometry. So this gives us the relative atomic mass, AR, which is defined as the average mass of all the isotopes of an element on a scale where a carbon-12 atom has exactly has a mass of exactly 12 units. So despite all of this averaging stuff, we are still using a scale of carbon-12 as a mass of has a mass of 12 units all right so we're still using this scale it's very important so 
that is relative atomic mass, but we must also consider relative molecular mass, and this is uh, used when we have to calculate using the mass of molecules which involve more than one type of atom, more than one element. All right, and so the relative atomic mass is pretty straightforward. You just gotta add up all the relative uh, atomic masses for each of the atoms in a molecule in order to find its relative for, to find the molecule's relative molecular mass. So, for example, in our previous example, it was uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, we add uh, sixteen for six, two sixteens for our oxygen atoms and one twelve for our carbon atom. And so on, for example, water, it's 1 plus 16 plus 1 for the hydrogen and the oxygen, and ethanol for each respective hydrogen and oxygen and carbon atoms, we get a total, we get a total um, relative molecular mass of 46. Uh, for other species, such as ions, we have to use the relative formula mass, but the symbol MR is exactly the same as the relative molecular mass, just to point out. And uh, we, in order to find its relative formula mass, we just gotta add up all of the um, the relative atomic masses of each species in that ion. All right. So another example would be a nitrate ion. We just gotta add them all up, and that's pretty much it. That is the relative molecular and atomic mass. Or should I say the other way around? So to quickly summarize our video, the point one we're trying to make is that we're trying to we are basing all of our comparisons on a standard mass. Standard mass being the mass of the carbon-12 atom, carbon-12 isotope. Right? And um, we must understand the concept of a relative atomic mass. That's the average of all the isotopes in the element. We're using the scale of carbon-12 as having 12 units in, in the, basically the scale. And similarly, for relative molecular mass, for uh, calculations involving molecules that have more than one type of atom, and relative formula mass for basically ions. So thank you very much for watching my video. I hope you found this very useful. And uh, do go and watch our previous videos in our IGCSE revision, uh, chemistry revision series to make sure you haven't missed anything in your revision. So happy revising, everyone, and good luck.